Hey everyone, Gandorf here. Welcome back to the channel. If you're a returning viewer, if you're new, welcome. I hope you enjoy my format here on going through these boxes. Today we're back at Trihackney. We're doing Boogeyman 3, the third box in this series. And it is a workout box. So if you scroll down here in the introduction, it does list these rooms down here as prerequisites. If you have not done them, if you've never worked with Elastic, I would highly, highly, highly recommend you go do those rooms first to get a bit more familiar with it, because we will be using JSON queries here. So if you're not familiar with those formats or how to find the information you need for those, go take your time on these other boxes, learn a bit, and then come back to this. So alrighty, let's jump over into the box and we'll get started. First thing we we'll need to do is do a quick in-map. There is a HTTP website on this box, but there's no information we can use to do this challenge. So first thing we're going to do is do an in-map with the minimum rate of 1,000, scanning all the ports, and I've set the target IP to the machine. Alrighty, and we are back. It is done. As you can see, we found four ports. We have SSH and the HTTP port I mentioned. We have these other two here. Now with Elastic, if you don't remember, the 9200 is the API port, and the 9300 is the port it uses to talk to the uh, machines within its cluster. So we're going to be sending requests to this 9200 port. I'm going to show you a couple of things we got set up here. We're going to be using three different type of queries here, and I've got some curl statements saved here. Let's go ahead and cat out these curls, and we're going to take this first one here, and we're going to break it down real quick. All right, so what do we got here? Well, we're telling it to curl. We're telling you the payload is going to be the quarry one JSON. We're telling it to send as a application JSON packet. And then here is the address we're sending it to. So this is the username and login they gave you to the IP address. And I'm going to take a quick second to show you how you get this, which is the bank of data that we're looking through trying to find all this information. So, okay. So this right here, the basic curl statement, this just comes back, lets us know the name of the machine, its UUID, some other basic things about it. Now, I will leave a link down below to one of the documents for Elastic that kind of helps you know what all folders and things are accessible. Thing, what we're wanting to look at is the underscore cat. And when you do that, you get all these folders and information coming back. And the one we were interested in is this one right here, indices. And this is going to list out a lot of the different instances. Actually, just so you can see a little bit better, what we'll slash V. Oh, not slash V, question mark V. And that gives us a nice little format here so we can actually see what everything is. So this these indexes are what we were interested in. Now, if you remember the date format, in the setup for this room, it told you they expect they uh, found the incident or suspect the incident happened between the 29th and 30th of August. So we're wanting to look at this Windows log right here. So that's how we got to that and the first curl that I showed you. Real quick, let's take a look at what Quarry 1 is. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this JSON Quarry and we're going to tell it we want any username. So we got a wildcard here that has an event category of process as in the date range between the 29th and the 31st. And we're wanting to look in source, username, and host name. All right, so real quick, we're just going to go over this. So we're going to do a search size. And when you submit one of these queries to the JSON API, you have to give it what you want to do. So we're wanting to search, we're wanting to get results back. And now this is our wonderful little tool from Boogeyman 1, JQ. It's all going to be turned returned in JSON format, so we want to be able to sort it out. And actually, before we run it, let me show you why we have this section structured that way. Okay, so here is the output that I saved earlier. As you can see, it said it took 553 seconds to get all this information back. And if you remember JSON, its format is a tabbed hierarchy, is what I refer to it as. So your base of that hierarchy that we're looking at is right here, hence. The next one over is 
hints. And then we want the name down here because we're looking for usernames right now. So to get there, we go from this hints to source or underscore source, user, and name. So that's why the format looks like this in our query. So we'll run this. As you can see, result, we've got a couple of usernames here. And if you're anything like me, I've just learned over time to go ahead and make notes of anything interesting we find. So we got this is Evan Hutchison. If I can get that pulled back up. Got an Alan Smith. And we got administrator. Always interesting when we see those. And that's it for users. Now, if you look, we do have a few workstations in here noted by these dollar signs. DC01, workstation 51, workstation 1327. And also we got another user right here, IT admin, that has a decent amount of activity on it. So let's go ahead and grab these workstation names just in case you don't have to copy the dollar sign. But this is just something I like to do, just to make sure I have all these little tidbits with me in case I need them. So there we go. Let's clear this up. So what are we going to do with the names? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at query number two. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look for that specific username. And we're going to look for processes tied to it within that date range. And what we're doing down here is just kind of a nice little formatting of what we're wanting to look through for it. I've got our second curl statement here. And of course, we're going to be looking for Evelyn first in Quarry 2. As you can go through, you can see we're doing another search here of 3,000. We're looking just in that source section. And we're looking specifically for anything that has command line information. So this would be looking at stuff that was input by the user or the system. But most of the time, it's pretty much just going to be the user. Of course, we want to put through a nice formatting. And we're going to have it labeled all nice and neat and sort it. This should just take a second run. There we go. I'm going to have uh, pretty much all of this kind of grayed out. I'm going to try to take a screenshot or two, so I'll have some things to show you to walk you through. But what you want to do, we're going to get started on the questions here, is scroll all the way back up to the top. We'll leave this first line unblurred so I can walk you through what you're looking at here, and then we'll get on to the question. So over here, we have our time and date stamp. Next is we have the user. So in our query, we were looking for Evelyn. This is the PID of the command that was written over here, or entered over here. This is the parent PID of this. And then here is the command that was ran. So that's the different segments of this. So now on to the questions. First one, what is the PID of the process that executed the initial stage one payload? Well, if you remember the name of the PDF that was given to us in the initial investigation, that's the what we're looking for. So you find that, you'll find the PID in that first column of PIDs, remember I showed you. Next question, stage one payload attempted to implant a file to another location. What is the full command line value of this execution? Take some time to look through the command line output. Know your different type of commands for Windows. If you don't, you see a command you don't know, go look it up. That's going to be the but most I can tell you without giving you the giving away the answer. But also look for things that have a parent PID of the first question. That's going to help you out a lot here too. Question number three. The implanted file was eventually used and executed by a stage one payload. What is the full command line value of this execution? Again, go line by line. Look for things that have a parent PID of that first question. If you have a couple of them and you're not sure, just copy, paste, and put them in the answer until you find the right one. But again, this also goes back to knowing uh, certain files and certain commands that are ran on Windows and what they're used for. Number four, the stage one payload established a persistent mechanism. What is the name of the scheduled task created by the malicious script? Now, unlike the other boogeyman box where we were looking for a scheduled task, this does not use that command to do it. However, it does use a process to make a scheduled task, and it's kind of a long argument, a uh, command line argument there. Once you find it, if you don't know what you're looking at, what each segment is, I'm going to leave a link down below to a blog that I ran across that really helped me to break it down to understand what each aspect was to eventually 
realize what the name of the task was. Question 5. The execution of the implanted fall inside the machine has initiated a potential C2 connection. What is the IP and port used by this connection? So this one is a little bit more tricky. This is where you need to understand how to follow along those command line arguments to understand what's going, what's happening. So basically you want to look down until you find a large chunk of base64 data. That is going to be what it's referring to as the C2 connection. What we're going to do is do a third query search using the PID of that process. So the PID of that is going to be 6160 right here. And clear this out. Let me show you real quick. Query number three. So there we go, that's 6160, that process ID that we found. And we're going to should match category network within that time frame. And we're looking at the timestamp, host name, source IP, and all this stuff. Okay, so I've grabbed our third curl statement. And again, I'm going to have all three of these curl statements listed down in the description below, so if you can just copy and paste them. Pretty much, this is like before, we're doing a search size of 3,000. We're looking in the source of the results, and we're just formatting out nice and neat so we can see what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to have the answer blurred out, of course. Basically for this one, which one has the largest amount of counts on it, the number on the far left column there, that's going to be your answer. Question six, the attacker has discovered that the current access is a local administrator. What is the name of the process used by the attacker to execute a UAC bypass? Run second query if you need to, if you don't have it already open, and follow the process and the command. What you're wanting to look for is before that block of 64 code, what was executed. It may take a couple of tries for you to get the right program, but it is there. Just have patience, go through it, try to understand what it is you're reading and the steps that was taken. Number seven, having a high privilege machine access, the attacker attempted to dump the credentials inside the machine. What is the GitHub link used by the attacker to download a tool for credential dumping? Again, query two, you wanna look through, look for a GitHub link. And if you're having a hard time finding it, try to rerun it, except do a, actually I'll just show you right here. We're going to rerun it, and we'll just grep, and we'll look for the word GitHub. All right, I'll have all this blocked out. That's going to give you your answer there. It is a very common tool. If you don't recognize the name of it, it's a take some time to go learn about it. It's a really, really cool tool. Question eight. After successfully dumping the credentials inside the machine, the attacker used the credentials to gain access to another machine. What is the username and hash of the new credential pair? Now again, in that query 2 dump with Evelyn in our query, the answer is in there. Um, after the tool is downloaded, just look for it being used. If you're, again, if you're having a hard time finding it and uh, do a grep instead of GitHub, you want to look for the name of that tool that was downloaded. You'll find your answer there. Question 9. Using the new credentials, the attacker attempted to enumerate accessible file shares. What is the name of the file accessed by the attacker from a remote share? Okay, so the answer for this one is just a few lines down where you just found that username and hash. That's all I'm going to tell you. Again, you're just going to have to really learn how to go through these command line outputs and read them step by step and understand what's going on. All right, number 10. After getting the contents of the remote file, the attacker used the new credentials to move laterally. What is the new set of credentials discovered by the attacker? format of username password. Now this one can be a little hard to know exactly the username that it's referring to here, but right after the file that we just found, you'll see a few lines that look repetitive and you should see something that sticks out as a very obvious password. So in those lines, that's your username and password are gonna be in there. Number 11, what is the host name of the attacker's target machine for its lateral movement attempt? Well, remember we found those three machines earlier? We're not quite at a domain controller yet, so it's not the DCO one, so it's one of the other two. 
Try those out and see which one you get for your answer. Number 12. Using the malicious command executed by the attacker from the first machine to move laterally, what is the parent process name of the malicious command executed on the second compromised machine? Boy, that was a mouthful. So take note here, we have moved machine. So we most likely have moved users. So what we're going to need to do is come back over here and we need to go into Quarry 2 and we're going to replace Evelyn here with Alan. And then rerun that Quarry 2 and scroll back up to the top and we're going to do the same process. Just start there and work your way down. Now for this one, it's going to be one of the very first things listed. Again, take some time. If you see an executable or a command that you're not familiar with, go Google it and learn a little bit about it. It should help you out. Number 13. The attacker then dumped the hashes in the second machine. What is the username and hash of the newly dumped credentials? Again, we're looking for a username and a hash. Just like with the, the first machine, he will need to download that tool from GitHub and then run it. So we're looking for a similar process that we found the first time. Number 14. After gaining access to the domain controller, or switching machines again, the attacker attempted to dump the hashes via the DC sync attack. Aside from the administrator account, what account did the attacker dump? So since we're switching accounts again, let's go back in to our quarry 2. And I'm going to copy paste this because I always have a hard time typing the word administrator out for some reason. Save that and rerun the quarry. Go back up to the top and start taking your time working through. And again, it's talking about credential dumping. We've just looked this up again, so you should know what to look for in these logs to find the user as different than we haven't seen before. Alrighty, and the last question, number 15. After dumping the hashes, the attacker attempted to download another remote file to execute ransomware. What is the link used by the attacker to download the ransomware binary? So in this last Quarry 2 run that we've done, using the administrator name, it is in there. However, again, if you're having a hard time finding it, you can rerun that Quarry, but do a pipe grep HTTP on it, and that'll give you all the web links that it finds, and one of them will stick out. That'll be your answer. All right, so that was Boogeyman 3. I really hope you enjoyed this walkthrough and found it useful. If you did, please like and subscribe and maybe consider sharing so others can find it. And that'll be all for today. I hope to see you back next week when we hit up yet another box. You have a good week.